Good evening, everyone. I am Michelle Leifer, and I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center in New York City. Along with my colleague, Kimberly Young, thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, Unidentified Canine Respiratory Illness with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This webinar is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you have questions or concerns about your pet's health, it is always best to consult your veterinarian. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you'd like to share it with a friend. Uh, we'll also send out a link to resources that are mentioned in tonight's talk. So we appreciate the tremendous interest in tonight's event and are grateful to those who sent in questions ahead of time. Dr. Hohenhaus has incorporated many of those responses into her presentation and will also take some questions at the end of her presentation via the chat box. Please keep in mind, once again, that we can't address specific questions about individual pets. So if you have a question about your pet's health, please reach out to your veterinarian. And now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. Dr. Ann Hohenhaus is a senior veterinarian at the Shoresman Animal Medical Center in New York City. She is a third generation veterinarian who earned her veterinary degree from Cornell University and is double board certified in small animal internal medicine and oncology. As AMC's Director of Pet Health Information, she writes AMC's weekly blog, hosts a monthly Ask the Vet podcast, and regularly speaks to national media about animal health. She contributes widely to research articles and textbooks, lectures internationally, and has won many prestigious awards for her work in both veterinary medicine and journalism. In 2021, she joined the World Small Animal Veterinary Association's Oncology Working Group, which she currently chairs. We are grateful to have her with us to lead tonight's event. Please welcome Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that kind uh, inv introduction. And let me share my screen here. There we go. So I want to start first by talking about what is canine infectious respiratory disease complex. So if you start hunting around on Facebook or other internet sites, you're going to see this abbreviation C-I-R- DC, canine infectious respiratory disease complex. And the colloquial translation of that is kennel cough. Um, and kennel cough gets its name because it is an infectious cough that is commonly spread between dogs that are in close quarters like kennels. But it could be doggy daycare. It could be um, a dog playground, a dog park outdoors, anywhere where dogs are in close contact. And kennel cough is really common in shelter situations where you've got many unvaccinated or poorly vaccinated dogs coming and going in tight quarters. So a few years ago, they stopped, veterinarians stopped talking about kennel cough and started talking about canine infectious respiratory disease complex. And that's because it's kind of a complex situation. So this uh, disease can be caused by multiple different organisms. So under the bacterial category, Bordetella brachyseptica, which is what the kennel cough vaccine is that your dog gets squirted up their nose or in their mouth on an annual basis. There's a an equine related bacteria called Streptococcus equi zoo epidemicus. And I believe there's an outbreak of that going on in a Colorado shelter, or maybe it was San Diego, but somewhere out West right now. Then mycoplasma came to the forefront a few years ago as a cause of kennel cough. And then if you're 
closely following the information coming out of New Hampshire, which is one of the sites where this respiratory uptick has been reported. They report on this Iola KY405, but no one knows it's a, it's a weird bacteria. Uh, mycoplasma is a weird bacteria too. And this is something that has been found in some, but not all dogs that are sick. And so that's why it's got three question marks after it is we don't really know if it is related or not to the current ongoing outbreak. There is uh, this, this type of bacteria has been identified in people with respiratory disease. So that I think is why it's on scientists radar. Now in the virus category, this list is not complete because it doesn't fit on the slide and it's mostly words that are unfamiliar to an audience like tonight. But parainfluenza, canine influenza, dis canine distemper virus, canine adenovirus 2, canine respiratory coronavirus, which is not the same thing as the COVID coronavirus. This is a dog specific coronavirus and canine pneumovirus. These are all viral causes of canine infectious respiratory disease complex. And I, I pulled this chart on the right hand side out of a very recent paper out of um, the veterinary school in Athens, Georgia. Uh, University of Georgia, and they asked the question, if dogs have canine infectious respiratory disease complex, what causes it? And what you can see in this chart is that um, mycoplasma, here are two mycoplasmas, mycoplasma canis and mycoplasma sinos, these uh, were found in around 20 to 25% of dogs with respiratory disease. Whereas Bordetella, which we kind of traditionally think as the cause of kennel cough, was only in 10% of dogs. And then canine uh, parainfluenza was in, in third place at about 15%. And then a smattering of adenovirus, distemper virus, herpes virus, another potential cause, um, mostly in puppies, uh, respiratory coronavirus, influenza virus, and strep zoo, uh, in a tiny percentage of animals. So that's why we call this a disease complex is because it's not caused by one particular organism. It's caused by a number of organisms which spread rapidly between dogs, especially when dogs are in close quarters. What also is interesting uh, in this particular paper is 50% of the dogs are just shy of 50% could not have any organism identified. And that's that's what people are worried about right now is that their dogs are being tested and yet no organisms are being identified in these sick coughing dogs. The other thing that this data showed was that around 15 to 30% of dogs have more than one organism isolated uh, at a particular time. So there can be no organisms that we can find causing it. There can be the common players and there can also be multi-organism infections, which I, I hope that I've made a good case for the fact that this is a complex complex. Now, this picture here shows one of my patients, Ajax, very bad wire hair dachshund. He came in for coughing and bad breath. And look, he's coughing, he's got his coughing and bad breath, and he doesn't have canine upper respiratory, infectious respiratory complex. He's got a stick stuck between his teeth. So just because you're a dog who's coughs, it does not mean that you've got this disorder. Um, what's been reported in these dogs are coughing, nasal discharge, fever over 102 and a half and runny eyes. But remember that there are many things that can cause this constellation of clinical signs. And so just because your dog has one or more of these, they could just have a stick stuck in the roof of their mouth. And that's why, um, as Michelle said in the introduction, if you have questions about your pet, you need to go to your veterinarian. So what causes coughing in dogs besides sticks caught in the roof of their mouth? Well, the organs here that you see in red circles 
if those organs are diseased, you may see coughing in your dog. And notice there's a couple of digestive organs in addition to respiratory ones. So for example, dogs with laryngeal disease may cough, uh, which means dogs who have laryngeal paralysis are frequent kind of cough or gagger dogs, especially after eating or drinking. If your dog has tonsillitis, your tonsils are big, they, they cough because those tonsils are sticking out in their airway and they're uncomfortable. Um, and then of course, we think of kennel cough as really infectious tracheal bronchitis. That's, that's, the, um, that's the doctor term for it. Um, and so a tracheal inflammation or infection would cause coughing. But also notice the esophagus and stomach are on this list. And that's because uh, dogs with esophageal disease, uh, dogs with stomach disease like gastroesophageal reflux, where the acid bubbles out of your stomach into your esophagus, those dogs are, are going to cough. And there have been a number of recent papers that have linked GI disease with respiratory disease. So just because your dog coughs doesn't mean it has respiratory disease. It in fact may have esophageal or gastric stomach disease. And then finally, lung disease is a big causer of coughing. So there's a lot of talk on the internet about my dog had a chest x-ray and he has pneumonia. So the first thing that you want to start with is understanding what a normal dog chest x-ray looks like. And then I'm going to show you a couple of abnormal dogs. So this panel right here is the dog that L means his left side is down on the x-ray table. And this is the dog, an x-ray taken from side to side. This is the dog's neck and front legs. This is the dog's backbone. And each one of these is a rib wrapping around the chest. And then this is the dog's heart. And this line here is the diaphragm that divides the chest from the abdomen. This is the microchip. And then if we look at this view, here's the microchip right here. And this is the dog laying on the table like Superman uh, with an x-ray taken shot top to bottom. And again, heart in the middle and lungs out here. Now, on x-rays, air is black. And so this is outside the dog. This is, this is the dog's back right here. So this is black because it's air in the room, in the radiology room. And you notice that it's kind of black in this area too. And that's because those are the lungs. And lungs should be full of air and therefore mostly black. And then this is the dog's windpipe, which is also full of air. And so it will be mostly black. And then this is a little air in the GI tract and it's sort of black. Um, so black is air and in a dog's lungs, black is good because black means you got air in your lungs and that's where it's supposed to be. And that you don't have infection or pneumonia in your lungs. Now, um, Lung disease causes coughing. So what kind of lung diseases cause coughing? Well, infection with parasites, heartworm disease, for example, causes coughing. Most dogs cough like crazy. We luckily don't see very many here in New York causing coughing. Uh, bacterial diseases and viral diseases. And I just gave you a whole laundry list of those diseases that cause kennel cough. Um, and so infection is a common cause of coughing in dogs. We see a weird disease in dogs called eosinophilic bronchopneumopathy, which means the lungs get all full of weird blood cells called eosinophils. And that may be due to parasites, or it may be due to some sort of aberrant allergic reaction. And then finally, cancer in the lungs will cause coughing. And so this is a dog that cancer has sadly spread to its lungs. And remember I said the lung should be pretty black. So we see the black windpipe coming down here. And then we don't see so much black that we saw in those previous x-rays because this dog has a tumor here and another one here and another one here 
and here and here and here. And so this dog comes in coughing, but it does not have canine infectious respiratory disease complex. This dog is coughing because it has cancer. So coughing is not equal to canine infectious respiratory disease, although dogs with canine infectious respiratory disease cough. Now, this is a dog with pneumonia, um, and this is not a dog that has canine infectious respiratory disease. This is a little kind of squash-faced dog, a brachycephalic dog, we call them. And this, those dogs, because their face and airways are not normal, are very prone to getting pneumonia. So once again, we have the black air in the trachea. And then here, where it should be black, it's kind of white looking. And then down here, here's another white patch where it should be black. And then here's a little white V. And all of those white spots represent pneumonia in this dog's lungs. When we look at the dog from top to bottom, remember laying on the table like Superman, we've got mostly black on this side. But then over here, the black kind of fades away in this particular area. And if we look at that close up, you see black here kind of looks like that wind pipe I showed you over here. Well, it's a different pipe. It's a bronchus, one of the main breathing tubes in the lungs. And the reason it stands out so well is that the pneumonia here, which is white and white on this side, highlights that black air-filled bronchus, making it easy to see. So this highlighted bronchus is a, a typical thing that we look for when we're trying to decide if a dog has pneumonia. So there is so much on the internet, and I've spent a lot of time on the internet because this episode of canine infectious respiratory disease that seems to be upticking right now is so new that there aren't any scientific bits of information out there about this particular disease. So when I look at internet information, I'm always asking myself, am I looking at a quality source? And, and you should be doing this too when you're looking on the internet. So what's a quality source for information about your pet's health care? Well, one would be your veterinarian or your veterinarian's website. Another would be that if your veterinarian doesn't have a website, um, and lots of small hospitals have a more a business website than a medical information website, you might want to check your nearest College of Veterinary Medicine, because a lot of them have websites with lots and lots and lots of good health information for pets on them. You could also try a professional association. So the American Veterinary Medical Association has a gigantic website, and they've got information on it um, that they've been updating about this current outbreak of uh, canine infectious respiratory disease. You could try an educational institution. So in the human world, you might think about the Mayo Clinic. That would be a great place um, to find information about health. Or you could check an educational institution like the Animal Medical Center's website because we have lots of health, pet health information on our website. And then you might find a research publication. And one of the resources that we're gonna provide you with tomorrow is a research publication from the American Animal Hospital Association. So the Animal Medical Center is a uh, AHA certified hospital and the uh, American Animal Hospital Association has a very nice publication on uh, infection control. And so we're that's free to the public and we're sharing that with you tomorrow. The other thing that you need to be careful in this current outbreak is there are a lot of pet owners out there who say, my veterinarian gave drug X and my pet is all better. So you should, you should have your veterinarian give that drug too. And that just because it worked in dog, one dog doesn't really mean it's going to work in a lot of dogs. And it may not actually have worked in that dog. Maybe that dog just got better on its own. So 
be very cautious when someone is touting something that is only one dog that this treatment made a better manuka honey made my dog better or chloramphenicol made my dog better chloramphenicol is a good antibiotic but it's some it's a drug you need to have a lot of respect for and a very good reason to use that drug but you don't want to show up in your veterinarian's office because your dog has a sniffle and a little bit of a cough and ask for a very important antibiotic like that just because you read on the internet that's the right thing to do the other thing that's a challenge in this current respiratory outbreak is we don't know who really has something different than usual and so there's not been a very clear definition of what this atypical mysterious or unidentified canine respiratory infectious disease outbreak is. It just seems like there's kind of an uptick going on, but what's causing it is unclear. And so it's hard to know if the, the diseases that the people are talking about are simply a dog with a chronic collapsing trachea that is all of a sudden coughing more because of some reason, or if this is really an infectious problem that's happening in a lot of dogs. And so people are struggling, veterinarians are struggling right now to try and understand if this is more of the same old diseases we already always see, or if it's really something different. And that's people are working really hard on this and and the answer doesn't seem to be easy right now so this is something that we took off the internet there's a facebook page called 2023 canine infectious respiratory disease complex tracking and the people who are running this website started out trying to ask the question, how many coughing dogs with infectious respiratory disease are out there? And then they put a little mark on the map every time they got somebody to message them and say this was going on. Then this kind of got misconstrued as a map of this atypical disease that's going on. And so then everybody got all confused. And this is, this is the challenge with reporting diseases that we're not quite sure what they are yet, is this map got a little bit jumbled in people's interpretation of it. And so the people that are running this website are trying really hard to collect information on dogs with infectious respiratory disease, not focusing on those dogs who have the what's currently being called the atypical disease. And what this map shows absolutely very clearly is Canine respiratory disease occurs all over the country. And that's no surprise. Veterinarians every single day see dogs who are coughing, sneezing, runny eyes, maybe running a little bit of fever. Respiratory disease, just like in people, is really common in dogs. And so this is not a map at all of some new disease, but this is just people reporting dogs who are coughing that they think have infectious respiratory disease. And I'm sorry, just one thing I just want to make sure people understand that this map or this whole tracking system was pet owners created this. This wasn't officially corrected. Uh, established. Right. And, yeah. and that's one of the problems that veterinarians and pet owners or dog owners are having right now is that diseases like canine infectious respiratory disease complex are not reportable to anyone. So when the COVID outbreak started, that disease was reportable and people tracked very carefully how many people were sick. If people get leptospirosis, that's a reportable disease and it's tracked because it's risk for people and dogs. But coughing, sneezing people and coughing, sneezing dogs are not reportable. And therefore, it's very difficult to track what's going on because there's no official mechanism in play to try and track disease. And so there are some surrogate ways that we can try and get at this information. Um, and I want to thank True Panion for posting this information on their website so that I could poach it right off of it. Uh, True Panion hosted a webinar last week. And what they did, because there's no tracking system for animals, 
is that they took their insurance data for U.S. and Canada, and they asked the question between December 2020 and September 2023, how many claims for respiratory disease did we pay? And so you can see that that there's no numbers on this. This is just kind of an undulating number. Um, and they, they did a, a three-month average to create this particular chart. But what you see is respiratory disease goes up and it goes down and then it goes up again and then it goes down a little and it goes back up. And that's typical of respiratory diseases. Now, there is kind of an overall upward trend here. And so maybe that suggests that respiratory disease is overall a little bit on an uptick. But the experts who interpreted this data say this is much more typical of the baseline waxing and waning of respiratory disease that veterinarians see every day and have been seeing every day for decades. Now, that's in contrast to this next slide I'm going to show you. So I took the data from the two papers highlighted on the right. And this is data about canine influenza. And this data comes from the same group um, out of the shelter medicine group at the University of Florida, who is very instrumental in identifying the original canine influenza outbreak. And they did a, they went back to their freezers. These researchers in this particular paper here had saved blood samples in the freezer. And so they went back to those blood samples prior to 2004 and said, did any of these dogs have influenza? And notice that my, my data point for 2004 says zero. Then when influenza showed up in 2005, and I'm using the data from this second paper, notice that in a one-year span, the number of dogs testing positive for influenza went from zero to 42%. And then by 2007, it was up to 60-some percent. And by 2009, it dropped way down to about 15%. This is the classic spike that you see in a new disease where everyone is naive or never been exposed to that disease before. Everybody gets sick, all dogs are infected, and then as everyone gets infected and develops immunity, the disease ticks down. And so this is an example of an what a new disease will do in a population of dogs, which this graph is completely different than the graph I showed you before, which is the well-established chronic respiratory diseases that kind of come and go seasonally. So right now, dog owners are really worried about what they can do. And so People are puzzled by the recommendation to vaccinate because the testing has not implicated parainfluenza, canine influenza, or Bordetella. But what we're trying to avoid here is what's called a twindemic, meaning if there's really some new respiratory disease out there, you don't want your dog to have the flu and something new too. So vaccinate your dog for what it can be vaccinated against. And that's these three uh, organisms, two viruses and a bacteria. Now, my friend Clyde here um, is on this slide. Well, first, because Clyde is really cute, but second of all, because Clyde is a risk factor. Clyde is one of those cute squash-faced dogs whose respiratory system is not normal. And so he's a risk factor. Uh, just by his anatomic setup, he's at risk for worse respiratory disease. So squish-faced dogs, older dogs, dogs with clapping trachea, dogs with other serious illnesses, dogs that are immunocompromised are at greater risk for problems from some sort of respiratory infection. And so those would be the dogs who we need to protect, first with vaccination, and then second, by avoiding other dogs. And you know, it's the holiday season, and so that's hard because everyone's got a trip planned with their dog to see the family, or everybody's got that reservation at the dog spa so that, um, 
slide can go and have a good time while the family is away visiting friends. But you need to think about whether or not that's really what you want to do. You need to ask the question, is my community having an outbreak? Um, am I willing to take the risk with my dog or do I need to come up with another plan? The answer is not going to be the same for everyone. Um, but you just need to ask yourself those questions in trying to protect your dog. Now, the other things um, that you want to do are do not self-medicate or do not decide to open that cabinet where you've been stockpiling those leftover pills from this dog or your other dogs and say, well, this is what Spike got when he had a cough. I'm going to give this to my dog. Um, that can be risky. Medications can be expired. Medications can be not right for the dog. Medications can have side effects. And so empty out that closet uh, by disposing of the medications appropriately, and then go to see your veterinarian if you're really worried and think your pet needs a medication because your veterinarian knows your pet the best. People the other thing to think about is to allow testing. If your dog gets sick and your veterinarian says, geez, I really think your dog should have a chest x-ray, really think hard about saying yes, because that is a good recommendation in a dog who's coughing to try and identify pneumonia, as I showed you in those x-rays earlier. There is a big panel of tests um, that uses DNA analysis to try and identify what organisms are causing coughing in dogs. And I'll come back to that in a minute. No, no diagnostic test is perfect. And although it sounds great, it's a DNA test and DNA is really cool. It, if, if you get a positive result, that probably is helpful in knowing what it is. It may not always help your veterinarian to treat better because if a virus is identified, we don't have treatment for these particular viruses in dogs. So that's just something to keep in mind is testing will help you to know what is wrong with your dog. It may not help your veterinarian to treat. Another test that we often recommend in dogs with respiratory disease is a tracheal wash or a bronchoscopy. Both of those tests go down into the dog's airway and try and get samples of the organism causing the coughing and also the types of cells down in the lungs to help us focus our treatment more. And, and so a bronchoscopy or a tracheal wash may be something your veterinarian recommends. Now, I hesitate a little bit to mention this, but it's the scientist in me that is going to make me say this. And that is, if you are unfortunate enough to have your dog succumb to a respiratory illness, ask your veterinarian if an autopsy is possible. Doing an autopsy is sometimes the best way to find out what the cause of death in a dog was and help to investigate outbreaks like this. Wrenching for the family, I understand. Um, but both of my cats, when they died, had autopsies because it was very helpful to us to understand what was going on. Might not be for every family, but just at least think about it um, in your moment of uh, grief if your pet uh, succumbs to this disease. Now, there were some questions that came in before the talk about what test should I have done? And our friends at the um, Florida Shelter Medicine Group, University of Florida, have this fabulous table on their website and they deserve 100% full credit because they saved me from having to create this chart. And what they did was, these are all those organisms that I talked about that cause respiratory disease in dogs, infectious respiratory disease. You recognize them. Here's Bordetella bronchoseptica. Here's the influenzas. Here's our friend Mycoplasma. And here's that wonky horse bacteria. And the, they compared um, IDEX's respiratory panel 
Antex respiratory panel and Cornell's respiratory panel. And you can see that these panels are essentially identical. So Cornell doesn't look for herpes virus, but the other two do. And then Antex doesn't look for pneumovirus, but the other two do. Really, your veterinarian is likely to recommend one of these tests as a diagnostic test if your dog is having a coughing episode and they, your veterinarian thinks additional testing is really needed. And either any of these three tests is really a very good thing to do in your dog because it all of these look for the DNA of a lot of organisms that commonly cause coughing in dogs. Now, many of the dogs that are reported to have this unidentified atypical mysterious illness have had these panels and the panels seem to come up negative. So that's one of the reasons that this episode or this little outbreak that's going on seems to have been um, catching everyone's attention because the usual actors tests seem not to be coming up positive. Another question that was common for people uh, to send in before this session was, when should you go to your veterinarian or when should you go to the ER? So I'll answer the veterinarian question first. If your dog is coughing and you think you should go to the veterinarian, please call your veterinarian's office before you go because veterinarians are very worried about making other people's dogs sick by bringing a coughing dog through the waiting room. And so if you put them on alert that your dog is coughing, they may say, come at the end of the day. They may say, come early. They may say, come to the side door because many hospitals, not in Manhattan, uh, not in New York City, have a second entrance to allow um, animals with potentially infectious diseases to come and go without exposing other animals. So if your dog is coughing and not eating, coughing so much that they are vomiting because sometimes you cough and cough and cough and then they throw up. Those would be not eating or coughing resulting in vomiting needs to go to the veterinarian. Nasal discharge that's kind of clear or maybe whitish, probably not an emergency necessary for a trip yet. But if that nasal discharge turns green or yellow, probably needs to go to the veterinarian. And then if you're able to take your dog's temperature and it's over 102 and a half, that would be a fever in a dog and you should head to the veterinarian. ER, when do you go to the ER? So one of the resources that we're gonna provide you with tomorrow is a, a little video of a very cute dog who's taking a nap and therefore it's very easy to count his respiratory rate. And dogs with respiratory rates over 40 breaths per minute need to go to the ER. And so this video will help you practice because it's got a countdown clock um, and it tells you how many breaths the dog took during the countdown clock. So it's a very easy way to practice. Second thing is if your dog is breathing with their elbows out and their neck stretched forward, it's an emergency. And I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. If your dog, is working so hard to breathe that they can't seem to lie down. They try and lie down and they seem really tired and then they pop right back up because when they lay down, they aren't, can't breathe well enough. And then of course, if your dog is coughing and having trouble breathing and unable to walk, all those things should make you go to the nearest veterinary ER. So here's a dog in an oxygen cage. Um, you don't know that, but I know that. And look at this dog. He's got his mouth wide open. His tongue is a little blue-ish. And the dog's really anxious looking. It's got, and it couldn't open its mouth any further. And that's because this dog is having difficulty breathing. And I want to credit my friends at the Tufts Cardiology Service because they had this great video or this great uh, photo on their Heart Smart website. Again, so reliable source of information, veterinary school experts in cardiology showing a picture of a dog not breathing well. I'm very picky about my internet sources. 
Now, these are two videos of dogs seen at AMC. For those of you who've been to AMC, you'll recognize this as the bench in the back of the room, uh, in the back of the waiting room. And look at this dog. It is, oh, and maybe I have to turn my pointer off. Um, there we go. Look at, he's got his head and neck stretched way out. He's got his arms stretched forward. And if you watch his little chest, it's just heaving away there. And this is a dog in respiratory distress. Here's another dog. Notice it's got the same expression on its face as that white dog I showed you the picture of. Head and neck stretched out, elbows held out and working very hard to breathe. If your dog looks like this, it needs to go to the emergency room. And finally, there was a question about disinfectants. And should I disinfect my dog's paws? Should I wipe my dog's face off? Well, most disinfectants are not labeled for using on your dog. Most disinfectants are things you clean up the environment with. And so you can certainly wipe your dog down with a washcloth with soap and water, but I would not use any disinfectants on my dog. This, this is a really confusing table, but let me just point out a couple highlights because it is incredibly useful. And I learned a lot about disinfectants. So these are the disinfectants across the top. And then these are characteristics of the disinfectants going down. And what we want in this case, because canine infectious respiratory disease complex is caused by bacteria and viruses, is we want something in this peroxygen compound column, plus plus virus bacteria, or we want something in this coronary ammonia compound thing, plus plus virus and bacteria. And these two um, types of disinfectants are readily available. So the rescue wipes and sprays that we use at the Animal Medical Center are in fact a peroxygen, they've got peroxide in them. And so these are fast acting disinfectants that we have wipes, we wipe down tables and we spray tables and mop things up with peroxygen compounds. And then coronary ammonia compounds. Um, surprisingly, my Clorox wipes, I checked my bottle in the uh, cleaning cabinet, even though my wipes say Clorox on them with Clorox belongs over here in the chlorine group. Clorox makes wipes that don't have chlorine in them. They've got coronary ammonia compounds. And then I looked at Lysol wipes because Lysol, the real Lysol is a phenol, which you don't want to use, uh, especially around cats. And my Lysol wipes actually have, oops, where did that go? Um, my Lysol wipes have in them um, peroxygen compounds. So it's just because the wipes say Lysol or Clorox does not mean that tells you what is in your wipes. You've got to actually read that little teeny tiny print on the bottle of wipes in order to know what it is that you're cleaning with. And what you want is something with peroxide or something with um, benzalkonium chloride in it, which is very good against um, both bacteria and viruses. And this table for your perusal will be in the materials that we send to you um, after uh, tonight is finished. So I think that's my last slide. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And um, Michelle has carefully collated the questions into groups so that we can efficiently answer as many of your questions that came in before the talk as possible. Well, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Right. Thank you, Dr. Hohenhaus, for this wonderful overview. Um, and thank you all for sending in questions. Um, we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, first, I just to hit this, drive this point home is 
just the idea of the canine infectious respiratory disease complex or kennel cough, which you started out with, we see that you see that all the time, every year. So that's right that there are always respiratory illnesses. And then to so this one is is a little bit it is different or potentially different. Um what what makes this illness different from those that we're seeing? Well, we don't know that it's different. What people are observing, and and it yet has to be confirmed by very careful collection of data. But what is being observed right now is that PCR test, which we use commonly in canine infectious respiratory disease, is not coming up positive for any of the typical organisms that we see. So that PCR panel is completely negative. That's a little unexpected. The other thing is there seem to be people in Oregon that are think they're seeing an uptake and there are people on the East Coast in New Hampshire that think they're seeing an uptake, uptick in cases. And so are those really any more than the normal fluctuation? Are those cases in any way related? And we don't know right now because we cannot tie those cases together. Dogs don't travel as much as people do. So dog, we don't think dogs are necessarily dragging it around the country. And one explanation is the outbreak in Oregon is caused by something and the outbreak in New Hampshire is caused by something else. But since an organism has not been identified in these patients, it's hard to know that for sure. But there may be an uptake PCR testing is abnormal, and there seems to be dogs who are getting really sick, except all veterinarians know that when you have infectious respiratory disease, some dogs get really sick. So are we seeing more dogs that get really sick, or are we just seeing more respiratory disease, and therefore the same percentage of dogs are getting sick, but it's not a at which translates to a greater number. And so it's it's there's way more questions than answers right now, but because things seem like maybe it's a little bit different, there are a lot of people around the country trying to investigate this and sharing samples between labs to see if they can find a culprit or culprits in this situation. Okay, great. Um, and I think you said that just because of the severity isn't necessarily mean it's this mysterious disease because um as i believe you said it can progress to pneumonia other other types of um respiratory diseases i uh, think yeah. that that the, if you look at the numbers and and you have a hundred dogs with canine infectious respiratory disease probably one to ten percent of dogs will progress to pneumonia so then if you up that number. So if you have an increase in respiratory disease overall, so now we have a thousand dogs with respiratory disease, we're going to see more dogs with pneumonia, not because the disease is worse, we're still seeing 10%, one to 10%, but it's because there are more dogs with respiratory disease that you have a, a greater number of dogs, but not a greater percentage of dogs who are developing pneumonia and severe disease. Okay. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, let's see. How do you, so we're, we're talking about regular respiratory diseases. How do they tend to spread? Not the unidentified one, but just if we could take from that to some degree. It's yeah. the same thing with people. During COVID, the reason we wore masks is because our coughs and sneezes were what transmitted this virus through the air. And the same thing is true in dogs with respiratory diseases is either dogs are coughing and there's an aerosolized bacteria or virus that the dog number two breathes in, or you know how when dogs meet up, they go nose to nose and then they're transferring the virus that way. There's been a lot of chatter on the internet about water bowls, I mean, I guess that's possible, but I think it's much more likely that it's dogs who go nose to nose saying hi, or dogs who are coughing and sneezing and leaving virus in the air for the next dog to breathe. Okay. Um, and how are most, I know it depends on the severity, but respiratory illnesses treated? 
most respiratory illnesses, just like when you get a cold, you're going to get better with some chicken soup and some tea with honey and some rest and, um, you know, a lot of tissues. And most dogs with respiratory disease are going to get better with nothing. It's those dogs who develop a, a more significant disease, which would be dogs who get a fever, dogs who stop eating, and dogs who get a green icky nasal discharge. Those are the ones that are sick and um, they need to see a veterinarian. I, I just saw so a question has popped up in the chat that we need to address. And that is, is this COVID? Uh, yeah, the New Hampshire definitely. lab has screened their patients and report no COVID positive dogs uh, in, in the dogs that have been screened in New Hampshire. Also notice that uh, in those respiratory panels that I showed you, COVID testing can be added on um, to the testing. Um, if, if, for example, the, the dog has been exposed to people with COVID. Uh, but right now we don't have any evidence that this is being spread from dogs to people or that this is COVID spread to dogs. Stay tuned. I think this is an evolving situation. So six weeks from now might have a different answer, but right now, no. Okay. I know there has been also some speculation, not that this is COVID, but, or just the, that due to the pandemic, some of the, you know, people may not have, uh, there's like vaccine hesitancy, have, may not have been vaccinated, as well as the dogs may not have built up their natural immunity. So if you could speak a little bit about that. So yeah. COVID has absolutely changed the way, I don't know, maybe that we do almost everything. And so during the pandemic, lots of people didn't vaccinate their dogs because if you talk to your veterinarian, Bordetella, parainfluenza, and uh, influenza vaccines are not considered core vaccines, not vaccines that every veterinarian recommends for dogs. And so during the pandemic, like nobody was going anywhere. And so dogs weren't going to the boarding kennel and they were staying home with their owners. And so people might not have vaccinated their dogs against those diseases. So part of the question is, do we have dogs who are under immunized against this? And do we have dogs who are under exposed? Certainly the first trip I made after COVID was kind of over, I came home with a terrible respiratory infection. It wasn't COVID. I, every day I tested. and But a lot of people got sick because we took our masks off and our immunity had really gone down um, during COVID. So is this under vaccination? Is this dog immunity that's down and dogs that stayed home and weren't exposed to things are now getting sick? So I think all those things probably play at least in part into what we're seeing today. Okay, great. Um, we have some questions also many about just precautions and preventing the spread or preventing their own dog from getting this. So how what what can pet owners do rather than you know if they don't want to just stay home all the time and and you know not socialize their dog at all what can they do can they walk say hello to a dog on the street or just any recommendations for that or should they so, really stay away so that's a challenge if you have clyde that i showed in my picture clyde would be a dog who i would say is a high risk dog he's 12 years old, he has cancer. Um, we don't need Clyde to be getting a respiratory infection because that'll be really hard on Clyde. So it, it just depends on how much risk the pet, pet owner, the dog owner is willing to live with. If you have a really healthy three-year-old dog that's up to date on vaccinations and is bursting out of the apartment because it needs to go get some exercise, then maybe you, maybe that dog, maybe you're willing to take that risk. There's no one size fits all answer for dogs right now, because since we don't know what this is, it's hard to make a hard recommendation. Think about not exposing your dog to other dogs, maybe exposing your dogs to a small core of dogs that belong to your friends that you know those dogs are healthy and that if your 
friend's dog is sick, your friend would tell you. But the other thing to remember is, so your dog only walks with three other dogs at lunchtime with the dog walker. But do those three other dogs go to the boarding kennel on the weekend? Do those three other dogs uh, go to a play group on Wednesday night where they come in contact with dogs who might give them a respiratory infection? So you have to do a little sleuthing to figure out what might be your dog's risk factors that are not obvious to you. Um, probably outdoors is better than indoors, although people could, people during the pandemic went outdoors and sat on opposite ends of park benches with their friends, like I used to do in the park. So I could see someone dogs are not quite so controller, not quite so controllable as, um, uh, as people are. And I don't know that you could keep your dog um from going nose to nose with his friend when he meets up in the playground okay and we had a question um are there masks that dogs can use there are not masks that dogs can use i don't think any self-respecting dog would keep on a mask <laughs> um you can't keep that e-collar on them are you kidding um, or a bandage on their leg before they rip it off. There's just no way they're going to, they, they may not have thumbs, but they'll get that mask off in a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, we have several questions about, should I avoid the vet? Um, this one says that my eight-year-old pup has a dental cleaning scheduled. Is it risky? You know, I think maybe talking a little bit about the hospital, the biosecurity, that type of thing. So I, I alluded yeah. to that in my comment that if your dog is coughing and you're going to go to the veterinarian, be courteous and call the veterinarian's office and say, my dog is coughing and I think it needs to be seen. How can we make this work to protect other dogs? And then follow the veterinarian's instructions about the back door uh, coming late in the day. At AMC, we would whisk a coughing dog into a room and move them around the hospital as little as possible when someone would be following them with the rescue wipes and rescue spray, um, spritzing down and wiping down everything they come in contact with. And we when dogs like this need to go to radiology, we'll often do these patients late in the day when radiology is not as crowded. And hospitals usually, any AHA accredited hospital is going to have an, some way to isolate pets with infectious diseases to protect other animals in the hospital. So AMC has an isolation ward. It's got airflow that moves air out of that room, uh, it doesn't move it back into the hospital. And we have all those kinds of things available for um, protecting the patients in the hospital. If doctors go into an isolation room, then they put on what look like little hazmat suits, uh, gloves, and anything in isolation stays in isolation, stethoscopes, thermometers, medication administrating things so that we don't drag infection in and out of those isolation spaces. Okay. And that makes it safe for uh, also healthy pets to go in. They shouldn't skip a Correct. dental cleaning perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we have we seen an uptick in New York City of this mysterious, you know, we could talk about both. So, and why is it hard to know? So yeah. we... I don't think we know. We have to rely on um, veterinarians. Um, and I noticed a couple of New York City veterinarians logging in. So if if you guys have seen this, um, put it in the chat and then Michelle will report back on it. AMC does not believe it is seeing a dog was admitted with pneumonia today. It's a 12 year old dog. It's in the hospital all the time because it's pneumonia keeps coming back. This is not some mystery illness. This dog has had multiple hospitalizations for pneumonia. So um, we do not think we're seeing an uptick. Uh, I was on a Zoom earlier today with some other veterinarians and nobody really thinks that we're seeing an uptick in New York City right now. Okay. Stay tuned. Um, that can change. Um, okay. And and unless there is testing or, or diagnostic testing, you can't say for sure 
right? That that it is this mysterious. Well, disease. I don't know that this mysterious <laughs> disease but is that, anything yeah. other than normal dog respiratory stuff. Right. At the beginning, if you remember, I showed that chart where they asked the question, what causes respiratory disease in dogs with who have tests submitted to the laboratory in Athens, Georgia? And there were like 10 different things that came up positive on that. And what is important about that is that half the dogs that were looked at in the Athens lab had no organisms isolated. So it's not surprising for us to find dogs with respiratory disease that we cannot identify some cause, even with our fancy um, DNA testing. So I think that it is, um, it, it's hard to know if this is any different than our typical respiratory disease because no one's isolated anything common to all these dogs. And it may just be an uptick in our usual players that we can't identify. Um, and I think it, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, and I, it'll take, it's going to take months to sort this out, I think. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. Uh, it's well, again, are dog parks safe at off-peak hours, or is the organism in the ground, in the soil? Um, we maybe most for of these, yeah, most of yeah. these viruses are not particularly hardy. the The hardy virus, the virus that hangs around in the environment, is parvo. Uh, parvo right. hangs around a very long time. Even winter doesn't get rid of parvo. But respiratory viruses are pretty wimpy. So if no one else is in the dog park and you slip in for 20 minutes to exercise your energetic dog, you're probably that's probably the least risky time you can go to the dog park. Okay, great. Um, what are your thoughts on antibiotic? I'm sorry, antibiotic resistance. A little bit about we should that. all be worried about antibiotic resistance because antibiotics are overused in both human and veterinary medicine. And since most of the causes of canine infectious respiratory disease complex are viral, antibiotics don't help. Antibiotics help when a dog has pneumonia or secondary bacterial infection, but many of these dogs who have viral diseases will not respond to antibiotics because they don't respond to antibiotics. Antibiotics treat bacteria, not viruses. So misuse of antibiotics results in resistant bacteria developing, and that makes those antibiotics not good for dogs and for people. And so we need to protect our precious resource of antibiotics by being good stewards and using antibiotics when they're needed, but not in, in patients who don't need antibiotics. So if your veterinarian says, I don't think your dog needs antibiotics, listen to them and um, respect that significant decision on their part because they're trying to be a good steward of antibiotics. Okay, and then just to hit home on that is just with the chloramphenicol, but just that wouldn't be a first line drug that you would use, right, for this. So then you want to protect, yes. Yeah. So chloramphenicol is a great antibiotic, but you want to say that's this is one of the antibiotics that you want to use when you have a test that tells you you should give that antibiotic. And so somebody posted on the internet that their dog got better with chloramphenicol and then every newspaper in the country picked it up. And I'm sure every veterinarian around has been asked this week for chloramphenicol. So I see some heads shaking in the mm -hmm. Zoom boxes. So chloramphenicol, I use it in patients, but I use it only when I've got a test that tells me that chloramphenicol is the right antibiotic to use. And so um, it, I am not going to prescribe chloramphenicol, A, because you come in and ask for it, and B, because your dog is, is coughing. The um, International Society for uh, Companion Animal Infectious Diseases has a white paper on the best approach to using antibiotics in canine respiratory disease, and their first-line antibiotic is doxycycline. Good news is I've seen on the internet a lot of people saying, oh, my dog got doxycycline. And so 
veterinarians are following the recommendations of the International um, Society for Companion Animal Infectious Diseases uh, in being good antibiotic stewards by starting with doxycycline. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we had, okay, if we can't test for it, how do we know it's viral? We don't, we don't have any idea what it is. The, the reason that people think it might be viral is it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to respond to antibiotics. So that is, um, that is a, a chink in the, could this be a virus? Well, it doesn't seem to respond to antibiotics. So maybe one for virus. Um, and we know that there are lots of unidentified viruses that circulate around in both people and animals that cause colds or upper respiratory infections. So just guessing a virus is a good guess, but nobody knows whether this is viral or bacterial. Okay. Um, how about cats and people? There's how about cats to, to spread to cats or people? At this I point. haven't seen yeah. a scrap of information suggesting that this is something that go to cats. I think probably 60% of dog owning households also have a cat. So I think that if cats also got this, we might have a hint by now because people would say, oh, and the cat is sick. There are plenty of households that are reporting I took my dogs to a dog show and they both came home and now they're coughing. And so you'd think that some of those households would also have a cat in it. And I'm just not seeing that. That doesn't mean um, that that's just my opinion, but I haven't seen anyone talking about cats. Okay. Um, we want to just uh, more questions, a little more questions about um, daycare, dog day daycare. Um, you have a surgeon with a busy practice. I rely on dog daycare. My Siberian has been treated for pneumonia. When is it safe to go back to daycare? Um, well, it, it, you know, it depends on how you define safe. <laughs> Day, so upper respiratory diseases spread where dogs have close contact with other dogs. That's the definition of dog daycare. Um, and so I don't know that you can ever 100% say it's safe to go to day. It's same thing with kids. You send your kid to kindergarten and they all come home with runny noses and they're sick. I think that, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a risk of coming in contact with other people. The question is how much risk are you willing to take? Um, I might not send Clyde if Clyde were mine, he might not be going to doggy daycare because, mm -hmm. I would be worried about him catching a respiratory infection and he's got a lot of reasons to have a severe respiratory infection. My three-year-old, you know, kind of rough and tumble pit bull, uh, he doesn't, he's not a big risk factor. He might be okay to go to daycare, but um, think about how, whether or not you're willing to have the Siberian have another bout of pneumonia. And if you're not, then daycare is not probably where your dog should go. Okay. Um, since there's no official channel for tracking respiratory illnesses, how do we know if our community has an outbreak? Well, I, I think people are starting to ask the question, how can we track this? So a couple of things, veterinarians like chat with each other. Um, veterinarians get together for meetings. And so they're going to say, have you seen this? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either. I saw one case. I don't think it's a big deal. Or everyone will show up at dinner and say, I've had three cases this week. And then, you know, it's a problem. Um, is what was the state of Tennessee, Michelle? State of Tennessee asked veterinarians who are seeing increases in respiratory disease to please contact the state veterinarian. So certain states are starting to ask the question, can you let us know if you're seeing this? And I think we're gonna see more of that coming down the pike in the next few uh, weeks that people are going to start having ways to try and track this, although it will be voluntary, not required. And I think you were saying that to do it by a state makes more sense, right? So, well, so the scientist in me 
um, wants to know if your dog dies, why did it die? And that's why I'm interested in an autopsy. And the scientist in me also wants to have data that's helpful. So if I send my sample to a lab in California because I saw them on the internet, then California gets one New York sample and they don't realize that there's a big problem in New York because they only saw one sample. So if I, your veterinarian is going to have a plan for where their samples are going to go. Most of the time, veterinarians use Antec or IDEX. Those are the two big commercial labs. But I would try, and they have big databases. If I was going to send it to a diagnostic lab, then I would try and stick to the diagnostic lab close, um, close to me. Um, and that would be to send it to the New York State Diagnostic Lab. And most states have a diagnostic lab that will accept samples for testing like this. So that would be another way that, that you can help be a citizen scientist by keeping the samples close to home so that the people getting those samples start to see patterns in what's happening in their geographic location. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that is one of the biggest eye openers with this is that there isn't any tracking system or surveillance system for veterinary medicine, for respiratory. Right. So I think now they're, they're trying to implement this. But I think that's maybe part of what was confusing to people, you know, that that why why can't we figure out what this is? Um, there's there's a question in the chat that I think is really interesting, and that is there's a respiratory illness going on in China, mostly yeah. in children. And uh, I saw it a week or so ago in a Johns Hopkins infectious disease letter that I don't know, it comes to my email box. I don't know how I get it actually. And the interesting thing about what Johns Hopkins said about this respiratory outbreak is the Chinese are saying, these are all children who were quarantined in their early years during the pandemic. They wore masks for a very long time. There's a question in the chat that I think is really interesting. And that is there's a respiratory illness going on in China, mostly yeah. in children. And uh, I saw it a week or so ago in a Johns Hopkins infectious disease letter that, I don't know, it comes to my email box. I don't know how I get it, actually. And the interesting thing about what Johns Hopkins said about this respiratory outbreak is the Chinese are saying these are all children who were quarantined in their early years during the pandemic. They wore masks for a very long time, and they think this outbreak is a change in in human behavior because of COVID. Children not going out, children wearing masks, children not going to school. And one of the theories about this uptick in dog respiratory disease is exactly the same, that our dogs didn't get vaccinated during COVID because we couldn't go to the veterinarian. We didn't go out. It was hard to get around. Veterinarians were short staffed because they had COVID. And so we may be just seeing another COVID related situation, not because it's, it's the COVID virus, but because it is the um, change in our behavior towards our pets. Right now that makes a lot of sense. Um, Let's see, we have a, a question. Oh, okay, about about Paxlovid. On a network channel in Boston, I saw a vet giving sick dog Paxlovid. The, there is, like I said, with the chloramphenicol, there was one person who mm -hmm. said, oh, my dog got all better when I got chloramphenicol. And the same thing is true. Um, somebody said, oh, my dog got pavylaxoid. Well, there's not good data to tell us that pavyloxoid works in dogs, um, works against, we don't even know if this is a virus. So if we don't know it's a virus, why would we give that drug? Second of all, it's a human drug. And although a lot of human drugs get used in dogs, we don't have any data to tell us what's the right dose for pavyloxoid in dogs and what are the side effects of this drug in dogs because it hasn't been studied in dogs so i would be very reluctant to use an a medication that i don't even know the dose for a dog because dogs and people are a lot the same 
but the doses of medications are not always the same. Um, and that's why pharmacists call me all the time and say, you've made a mistake in this prescription. And I have to say, no, no, that's the dog dose of this drug. <laughs> this is a prescription for a dog. This is not a prescription for a person. Thank you for worrying about my patient, but trust me, this is the right dose. Um, the pharmacist is doing his job. I'm not complaining, but dog doses are not the same as people doses. Dogs don't always respond to drugs the same as people do. And so I, I'm very hesitant to think that we should just start prescribing pavylaxoid uh, for dogs with canine infectious respiratory disease complex. Great. Um, I know when you, you spoke about, earl about that earlier and also just if don't medicate, don't self-medicate your dog um, if you have it or if you have an old an older medication. Um, let's see. Uh, I, at the groomer, we can talk a little bit about, I, I know just it, it kind of falls under this, but is there any advice for groomers or anything that they can do to make this Well, I safer? think anything that groomers can do not to have five dogs dropped off all at the same time and then have them sitting around the grooming parlor, potentially coughing and sneezing on each other. And so holding clients to appointments, um, you know, sending one dog home while you're letting the next dog into the grooming place, um, there are some groomers that will come to your home. That would be another solution for people. Um, but if, if you've got a poodle, those things grow hair like you wouldn't believe. And you can't wait six months for someone to figure out what this is before you get your poodle groomed, or it will look like a sheep ready to be sheared. So you need to do everything you can to mitigate the risk be sure your dog is vaccinated. Um, if your dog is sick, it doesn't go to the groomer, so it doesn't infect other people. And then be kind to those people. And when your dog is well, hope that they're going to be kind to you and not take their sick dog to uh, the groomer. And then groomers need to limit the number of dogs that come in, but then also um, disinfect with one of the disinfectants that's on that messy chart that I showed you between animals so that you wipe down and get rid of any virus that's been coughed or sneezed on the table um, and on the supplies that you're using. Okay, great. Um, and then a couple more and um, see, how can we boost our dog's immunity? Will probiotics or supplements help at all? I don't know that I know the answer to that particular mm -hmm. question. Okay. Um, so I just not sure that there's something, since we don't know what this is, I don't know how we can boost their immunity um, to an unknown. Well, what about to just respiratory illness in general? I know it's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know that I know an answer to that. Okay. You know, your dog should not be overweight because overweight mm -hmm. makes respiratory disease worse. Um, your dog should be vaccinated, should be on heartworm, flea, and tick medications um, so that they don't have other problems that weaken their immune system. Okay. Um, and then is there anything service dog handlers can do to keep their dog safe? Right now, a lot of us are avoiding pet-friendly places, having our dogs wear shoes, and using disinfectant wipes when we get home. Wow. Wow. Um, mm. that's hard because you need, you need that service dog. But if, if you, if the service dog is going to a restaurant there, at least in New York city, they're not going to be 30 other dogs there. Like there would be in a grooming parlor, for example. So I guess I, the same thing I holds true, you know, mm -hmm. that dog is really important and I would do everything I could to mitigate its risk, meaning not the dog park, not a boarding kennel groomer. If it's needs to go because it's going to be just a total mess if it doesn't get groomed. But I think going about its business, I'm thinking of seeing eye dogs only because we see so many at AMC. I'm thinking that, um, those dogs don't encounter a lot of other dogs walking around on the street in New York. And certainly 
you should really never having your dog out walking on a leash, interacting with a service dog, that dog is working. And you don't want to distract it from doing its job. Those, those dogs are amazing and have a very, very, very difficult job. Don't make it harder for them. Um, and keep your dog away from them because those dogs are so important to their human. Well, on that note, I think it's a, a great place to end. Um, I want to thank you again, Dr. Hohenhaus. This was a fantastic and such a comprehensive talk. And um, just to remind everyone that we will send out a link to this recording tomorrow, as well as a link to some resources um, that we'll provide uh, you know, based on information provided in this talk. Um, thank you, Kimberly Young, for helping to coordinate this. And just a very special thanks to all of you. I know it's a, everyone's worried and um, concerned, but we hope that this provided at least some explanation. Um, of course, it's an evolving situation, and we, we will keep you posted. Um, but thank you, everyone, um, and we wish you a great night and a great holiday.